Welcome to Lesson 9C, Stokes' First Problem, Part 1. In this lesson, we'll introduce similarity solutions, and then I'll start an example problem called Stokes' First Problem, which we'll finish in some following lessons. I'll introduce similarity variables for this example problem. First, what is a similarity solution? A partial differential equation has a similarity solution when we can reduce the number of independent variables by at least one while still satisfying the boundary conditions. When is this possible? Typically, when there's no imposed length scale in the problem and or no imposed time scale in the problem. This is best illustrated by an example. Our example is called Stokes' first problem, which is also called the Rayleigh problem. It's the analysis of an impulsively started infinite wall. We have a wall that's originally at rest, but at time equals zero, the wall suddenly moves at speed capital U. Here are our approximations and assumptions. The wall itself is infinitely long and horizontal. Flow is two-dimensional into the page, which means any derivatives with respect to z are zero and w is zero. Pressure P is constant along the wall. Gravity acts in the negative y direction with this gravity vector. We have no imposed pressure gradient pushing this flow. In other words, del P del x is zero. And as I said, all the velocity components are zero at t equals zero, but u wall equal u for any time greater than zero. Finally, we make the argument that no x location is any different from any other x location. Whatever we see at x1 is identical to what we see at x2. Mathematically, del of anything del x is zero. And we are to calculate the velocity and pressure fields. Let's start with continuity, and we're in Cartesian coordinates. Applying our list of assumptions and approximations, 8, for example, says that del del x is zero, so this term goes away. Assumption 2 was the 2d assumption, so this reduces to del v del y equals zero which we can integrate, and since this is a partial integration, v is a function of the other variables. In this case, everything other than y, which is x, z, and time. But again, from our list, it can't be a function of x or z. Therefore, v equals v of time only. But at y equals zero, v equals zero at any time, since flow can't go through the wall. Therefore, v must be zero everywhere and for all time. This is the result of the continuity equation. Now let's look at y momentum, or the y component, of the Navier-Stokes equation, which I write here. But v is zero by continuity in the first and last terms. Thus this equation reduces to del p del y equal minus rho g, which we can integrate p equal negative rho g y, plus in general a function of the other variables x, z, and t but by the same arguments as above, nothing is a function of x or z, so we must conclude that p equal minus rho g y plus a function of time. But like we did with v, pressure is the wall pressure at y equals zero for all time, which tells us that f of t is p wall, which is a constant and not a function of time. Rearranging, our pressure field is p wall minus rho g y. But we recognize this as hydrostatic pressure in the vertical direction. But this is not hydrostatics. The fluid is moving. So why doesn't the pressure decrease as the speed increases? Well, Albert, you're talking about the Bernoulli effect, which applies to inertial flows with negligible friction. This flow is dominated by viscous effects. The Bernoulli effect is not applicable here. Ah, that is a good explanation. Thank you. You're welcome, Albert. Pressure decreases linearly as you go up, even though there's a flow. Now let's look at the x-momentum equation. I'll expand it out in Cartesian coordinates. Again, I'll cross off terms with the corresponding number of our assumption or approximation. Nothing is a function of x. v is 0 by continuity. It's 2d. Again, nothing is a function of x. There's no gravity in the x-direction. Assumption 8 again and the 2d approximation again. We're left with only two terms, del u del t equal nu, del squared u del y squared. I'll call this equation one, which is the 1d diffusion equation. This is the differential equation we need to solve, but we'll need boundary conditions to solve it. By the way, we need three of them, one for time and two for y. Here are our boundary conditions. 
at y equals zero, u equal capital U, since we're talking about all times greater than time t equals zero, at y equal infinity, far away from the wall, u is zero, and then one for time, at time equals zero, u equals zero everywhere. The first two are true for all times greater than zero. I called this a boundary condition, but it's actually an initial condition. With these boundary conditions, we should be able to solve this differential equation. Our mathematician friends would call this well-posed. We have one equation and one unknown, and we have the proper number of boundary conditions. I note also that this is a partial differential equation, since u is a function of both y and time. How do we solve this equation? It looks simple enough. You can try separating the variables. You can try using Laplace transforms or some other techniques. But instead, let's examine a similarity solution. We expect a similarity solution because there is no length scale in this problem. Since the wall is infinite and there's nothing special about any x location, and there is no time scale. Since we don't have a periodicity of any kind, there's no oscillation. So we should be able to combine y and t into a new independent variable, thus reducing the number of independent variables by 1, which as you recall was our definition of a similarity solution. Perhaps an easier way to think about this is that it does not matter how close or how far you are from the wall. You should see a similar event. Before I continue with the analysis, I summarize Stokes' first problem so far. Continuity equation yielded that v equals zero everywhere. Y momentum gave us hydrostatic pressure. And then X momentum gave us this diffusion equation with these three boundary conditions. And as I said, we want to somehow combine Y and T to get a similarity solution. And as I said, it doesn't matter how close or how far away we look at this flow. This leads me to what I like to call the giant and the ant argument. Both a tiny ant and a huge giant see exactly the same flow, but they have very different length and time scales. If I make them about the same size, both of them will see the same progression of flow from no flow to velocity profiles that look something like sketched. The ant sees this happening very rapidly in a short height. The giant sees it happening more slowly at a much bigger height. But if we can come up with a proper similarity solution and scale appropriately, they both see the same thing. Our goal, then, is to combine y and t such that one velocity profile describes the flow at all time and all y and for any incompressible Newtonian fluid. You can think of it as stretching the profile appropriately with size and time so that one profile will describe any time and any y location. This is what we mean by a similarity solution. And mathematically, we'll combine t and y into one variable, thus reducing the number of independent variables by 1, here from 2 to 1. How do we do this? Well, if I sketch u as a function of time, it always goes from 0 at infinity to capital U at the wall. So we expect the profile to grow like this. Let's take this middle profile and define delta as a function of time, where delta is the thickness of this velocity profile. And note that these profiles asymptote to 0. So we pick some small value like 1% of capital U, for example. Since delta grows with time, it's a function of time. So we let delta of t be the thickness of the velocity profile. We generate our similarity variables by non-dimensionalizing the problem, since we now have a length scale. For example, let eta equal y over delta. And let's let capital F be little u over big U. These are our similarity variables. Eta is the independent similarity variable, and f is the dependent similarity variable. The similarity assumption is that f is a function of eta only, or using our definitions, u over u is a function of y over delta of t. In the next lesson, we'll plug in these similarity variables into our differential equation, equation 1, and see if we can get a similarity solution. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.